In Jordan, farmland is becoming desert, putting the country's food supply at risk. What can be done to hold back the sand? Shaka Ishmael is among thousands of farmers in one of Jordan's driest and poorest regions who have been inspired by the past. Just as his ancestors did thousands of years ago, Shaka is having a cistern built to capture and store water during the rainy season in order to keep his crops alive during summer months. In the last few decades, young people like Shaka had been fleeing small villages in the driest regions in the south of Jordan, turning farming communities into ghost towns and tens of thousands of hectares of abandoned land into desert. With 80% of the country's staple crops grown in these rain-fed areas, Jordan's ability to grow enough food was at stake. Yet reversing the trend required the one thing Jordan didn't have to spare, more water. Then, three years ago, with support from IFAD, the UN agency mandated to help the poorest farmers, the government began providing farmers with the tools to collect rainwater not only building cisterns, but stone walls to prevent soil erosion, and switching to crops like almonds, pistachio, and olives, better suited to an arid climate. More than 5,000 farmers are now conserving water and earning more money thanks to the project. Even so, faced with an unusually dry year, these methods are being put to the test. Now we're heading to Karak. It's really one of the driest spots in Jordan and one of the poorest areas in the country. We're going there because we want to see what are people doing there in terms of the water. We know that the government has started a project trying to help farmers grow other crops that are less dependent on water, but still it's a challenge. Like this year, it's a dry year, there's very little rainfall water, and we want to see what are they doing about it? How are they going to manage? Will they survive? Ishtapag Abdalgaber is a widow, raising three children. She's also one of the farmers taking part in the project. Last year, she installed a cistern, and Rula wants to know if it's had an impact. It really made a difference after she started, after she had the cistern here, and after the cistern was built, because finally the trees are getting enough water, and as she says, even God says, we made out of water, we made everything alive. And so even the trees now, they look greener, they bet yield better olives, and she's very happy with that, and she thinks that really saved her and saved the trees. Activities like this are helping to slow the exodus from village to city. With a sustainable water supply and more than 100 olive trees, Ishtapag believes she and her children now have a future here. The next morning, Rula meets the project's manager, Jamil Jaffre, and together they travel even further south to the governorate of Tafilia, one of the driest spots in Jordan. When it rains here, the water picks up speed quickly, washing away anything that stands in its path. Jamil shows Rula one of the dozens of check dams built to slow the flow of water and spread it over a larger area. Before you, before you, built the, before you had built the check dams, there was no green here. Yes. It was all barren like the Only other like hills. The, uh, the but the green water. we're seeing now is because of the check dams. No, no. And the farmers are benefiting from this. No. Further down the road, Bedouin farmers herd their sheep toward one of 30 mini dams, also constructed to collect rainfall, giving these farmers an inexpensive source of water for their animals. And while having an abundant source of water in one of the driest spots in the country is a great help to these farmers, it can also create problems. Sometimes people from outside the designated farmers will try to come and use this water out of desperation. They'll try to use it as for irrigation. Sometimes it's workers building, uh, working in construction. They come here, they use the water uh, to build with it, and that's not allowed. It's a delicate balance. When a resource is scarce, people can't just take what they want, or someone downstream suffers. 
The biggest challenge facing Jamil, farmers and the government is to learn how to work together. Morning in the village of Anya. While some farmers head off to their fields, others have gathered here. Jamil and his staff have called a meeting to encourage local farmers to cooperate over their limited water resources. But anger is never far below the surface when water is the subject. Most of their concern involves two local springs, which had been restored by the project but are now destroyed. This man asked Jamil to come and see the damage for himself. Rainfall may be rare in this part of the country, but when it comes suddenly, as it did one month earlier for just 20 minutes, a flash flood can result. In this case, covering over two springs and destroying canals. They want desperately the project people and Abu Waddah, they're trying to convince him, please try to fix it. The flood water came down this road and then all the stones, all the rocks with the dirt blocked some of the canals, even went into the spring source and that is making the flow of the water very little and that's why they cannot irrigate as much as they want their crops and their crops now is in danger. But keeping the water flowing ultimately requires that the farmers themselves take responsibility and work together because one day the project won't be here. Mohandas Hassan, he works with the projects and he's telling them the project people are really eager to help them, but they need to help themselves first. They want them to clean these canals of the dirt, of the small stones. In that way, they feel that they're cooperating, they're, putting, they're having an input themselves, and that way Abu Waddah and Hassan can come in and help. Basically, it's all about cooperation. They all need to cooperate, the farmers, the project people, and if they don't, nothing is going to be done. What's being learned in these small villages across the south of Jordan can also be applied on a larger scale. Cooperation will bring water. Tension will not bring water. Wars will not bring water. On the contrary, it will destroy all the existing resources. And this was Jordan's strategy, to cooperate with neighboring countries in order to get water for both sides. One recent example of cooperation between Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority may in fact save the Dead Sea. Costing an estimated $3 billion, the idea is to pump water in from the Red Sea in the south, generating electricity and desalinating drinking water at the same time. For poor farmers in villages across the country, learning to collect and share scarce water resources offers some hope for the future. But as Rula reaches the end of her journey, there are many questions still unanswered. I mean, what do you do about all these issues that, in a way, people have no control of? The rainfall, the groundwater, the Dead Sea dying. What do you do about it? It just it feels that you need people to be so creative, maybe so cooperative, in order to find solutions. And perhaps one final lesson from Petra. 2,000 years ago, when water flowed through these canals to fields in surrounding settlements, this area was green and prosperous. After the Romans conquered the city, it fell into disrepair. Today, without water and ongoing attention to the earth, all that remains is desert. <laughs>